the shot. Oh, watch the. Uh, hey, you better walk on the ground. Huh? Just sitting on the floor. Am I in lighting? Or? I'm gonna sit back for some reason. Right here. Go for it. You make up just in case. <laughs> no, I get a right here. Let me drink. Let me get it out of the way. Here we go. Oh, you got speed, yeah. That's Is this for cable? Yes, Manhattan cable. Manhattan cable. We're on like we're on six times a week, all different hours, so we reach we have a good range of of viewers. And when you have a film coming out, do you run the interview? What do you edit it? And you run it, pieces it, of it? it with with clips exactly. Um, on this one. We're going to talk about, about the film and then talk a little, a little bit about your career. And we're going to focus too a little bit on like on your beginnings in terms of you know, your, your training and you're pretty interesting. Yeah. Okay, John. Action. Carrie, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. <laughs> your new picture is Murphy's Law for mm -hmm. Canon, uh, Charles Bronson action picture. Mm -hmm. And you play a real nasty. She's a bad girl. <laughs> <laughs> A really interesting character. Could you tell us a little bit about it? Um, my task in the film, or my task in accepting the job, actually, was um, creating believability, credibility. Um, to hire Carrie Snodgrass, the actress, to play a killer is one thing. For an audience to believe that she indeed can act out um, violence um, was the job that I had to consider if I was able to do that. So what I did is when I first met Jay Lee Thompson, I told him, first of all, that the script, as it was written, that I thought there were flaws in it. And the flaws were that um, pretty much uh, most of the killings were done with a gun. And I felt um, someone who's truly insane and committed to these acts of violence, um, to really show that insanity, a way to show that is to make a commitment to um, to those murders. Shooting a gun is very easy. Um, we developed the strangulation, um, the drowning of the of, in, of one fellow in one scene. <laughs> I don't want to tell too much, but um, we nurtured ideas of various ways of these um, killings because I felt to strangle someone, there's a commitment there. There's really a sense of of um, uh, uh, that fever. For, for the kill, um, in contrast to having distance between yourself and someone else and killing. He loved that. The other credibility point that I developed was the weightlifting. That was never in the script. Um, I lifted weights for about two and a half months. Um, and I believe that after you see that scene where she's lifting those weights, I believe from then on, you believe that she's capable. Um, so th that was the act of work that I did in terms of creating the character. And Jay Lee was, he has so much respect for actors that he was just going for anything, you know. Um, a lot of people have asked me, how could you commit yourself to such a violent, aggressive film? And my feelings about that are, I don't think anybody takes Charles Bronson's movies seriously. I think any man who can shoot a handgun 15 rounds, <laughs> I mean, we're already in fantasy right there, you know. In contrast to, say, doing a film like The Hitcher, um, to me, that's an investigation of a truly insane person on a very realistic level. Um, and I did this, uh, I wanted to do this role um, partly because most of the characters that I get cast in um, are victims of life. Most of my women, my child is dying of cancer, or my husband's an alcoholic, or something's wrong. Um, so it, it afforded me an opportunity to play a real, a real outgoing, forthright, determined kind of strong woman. And so um, these are all the, the combinations of things that made me say, yes, I'd like to do this role. It's interesting because especially it's not just anyone that you're out to get in this picture. It's an action icon, the indestructible Charles Bronson. Yes, exactly. Exactly. It's also a one-of-a-kind part. I mean, I think it's the first real villain woman um, or so actively villainous that he's had in his films. So 
That too seemed very attractive. <laughs> Quite a bit of the picture was shot at night on the streets of downtown LA. Yeah, four weeks of night shoot. It was uh, and a lot of hours, a lot, a lot of hours. And when you're dealing with uh, light, um, just being able to shoot during the dark um, and working against that time clock, the sunrise, it was really a very tight schedule. It was a lot of work and. Um, I must say, being in the streets in L.A. at night was awesome. Um, I saw things that you just you just forget about when you're living a life of, of creative, artistic development, or m part of me is being a mom. And I mean, you just don't conceive that there's so much real life going on. It was it was awesome. In uh, in filming some of the sequences, some of the uh, some more brutal sequences particularly the, uh, the drowning in the tub. That's a very, very powerful scene. Uh, uh, how did you prepare for that? Uh, I think the weightlifting helped me with the entire, th um, that sort of forthrightness of this character. Um, I was working out with a trainer who's um, huge. He's buffed beyond reason. And I used to watch these guys working out in front of the mirrors, you know, pushing themselves over that edge. And there is something visually that looks very insane in that. And in the lifting the weights, there's such a total concentration in the moment. I mean, it, you're so submerged in that because you're pushing your body beyond its normal endurance that I use that. I use that in the process of the filming. Just getting myself so isolated and just having a singular through line. Um, there were times that I'd be on the set and people would come up and start talking to me and I would exercise her coldness. I had to in a funny kind of way like I've never done before. I would ignore them because I'd be so steeped in that coldness that it was just impossible to break out of it and say, oh, how are you doing tonight? What, what did you do with your day? Nothing was funny when I got into her shoes and started standing in, in her consciousness, you know. Um, and I isolated a lot. I usually love being on the set and I love the crew and it's just such a total experience for me, a living experience. And I found myself isolating a lot, staying in my room, just working on the thoughts of resentments and, I mean, even some personal resentments that I cleared away during this film, oddly enough. Because just realizing, I mean, that is the basis of this character. She's, she was locked up for 10 years in an institution, and she's been living with 10 years of thought of getting out and getting these people who put her away. So... The character stalks Bronson throughout the picture, and then you actually the, don't have a scene with him until the confrontation. Yes, I never worked with the man. I don't think we ever had 20 words together because we never had a scene together until that last sequence. And that last sequence was a lot of stunt blocking. Um, that whole axe and the flipping over the rail and all of that was, I mean, it was precision work, it was precise work. Again, there wasn't room for idle chit-chat, you know, on the set. So I really never, I'm, I think we maybe had 20 words in the whole three months that we worked. What kind of feeling did you get from that location, that, the Bradbury building? Oh, the Bradbury building is beautiful, and at night it's it's eerie because it's um it's a building within a building. Um, once you go inside, there's all these balconies, and it's open all the way up six floors. So um, there's an echo in that building that's um, that f you can feel the mystery, you can feel the deceptive ability of her winding around that building and leading him, leading him, pulling him, pulling him out of his hiding places. Um, in that last sequence, as you know, there was that bow and arrow, that high power bow and arrow, which is fascinating. That's a fascinating piece of equipment. Um, and uh, it just, I, the body work was so easy working in that building because you could really go into the dark and once when you look up on the levels when somebody goes into the dark they're in the dark and moving moving and calling to him all around the building and it, oh it was just it was wonderful for the sense memory you know the sensory exercise was wonderful <laughs> this is your first picture for canon first picture for canon how did you find working for uh, Hollywood's resident Mavericks well, I find, you know, um, making films has changed a great deal in the last 15 years. Um, I've done other films that are on a, um, based on a small budget like this in contrast to 
you know, Diary of a Mad Housewife. I mean, there were so many luxuries that went along with the filming, you know. Um, there's no more luxuries for actors, I guess, unless you're, you know, the big guys. But, um, which I'm not really interested in being, you know. God forbid I should ever be paid a million dollars to do anything. But um, but I'm talking about the, the good luxuries. Um, my dressing room was the same size as the extras. Uh, I had to drive myself to the set, you know, in the middle of the night downtown and go home at 6.30 in the morning driving through downtown L.A. Um, it's, it makes the job harder, but I think it brings humility that's important to keep always identifying with, you know, that it's a job, just like everybody else does their job. you got to drive yourself to work like everybody else. There were some mornings I was pretty tired, though, uh, getting home. In L.A., you know, everything's so spread out, and I live so far from downtown that, you know, after shooting for 14 hours, having to drive uh, 20 miles was <laughs> pretty interesting. But uh, there's differences working for the small, you know, the smaller budget films. But um, the crew, everybody was very professional. Jay Lee Thompson, of course, is one of the great pros. He was wonderful as a director and and gave me a lot of respect with little choices, ideas of things I wanted to do. Certainly, your experience, uh, particularly in, in some of the TV movies. Uh, very fast filming. Uh. I like television, you know. Um, you, you don't carry the weight and the responsibility that you do with a film. So that kind of speed, and you, you play a lot with television, <laughs> you know. You kind of learn your words, you get sort of an idea of, of some character, physical traits, and you just go in and you play it, you know. And when it's finished, it's finished. Um, with film, it's a little different. Let's talk about uh, your your roots. Uh, you're mm -hmm. from uh, Illinois, Chicago, Barrington, Illinois. It was a town of 400 then. I hear it's um, about 28,000 now. It's turned into a like a horse raising thoroughbred ranch area. So it's changed quite a bit. But yeah, Chicago. I was there until I went to Hollywood. I was about 23. So you worked in Chicago theater. I went to Northern Illinois University. My dream was to be a drama teacher. Um, the academics. Um, depressed me, all the sciences and the math, and so I went to the Goodman Theater for five years, and it's a very comprehensive education in the theater. We had to have like three semesters of set construction, two semesters of set design, costume construction and design, fencing, speech, directing, art. We had um, we had to take six semesters of art history and contemporary art. I mean, it was a beautifully well-rounded education, and um, I had an opportunity to do things that 18, 19 year olds will ne would never have a chance to do. Moliere, Shakespeare, Chekhov. I mean, all the greats, the classics. Because it was a small theater, a studio theater, and then a beautiful big proscenium, wood, oak, and walnut state proscenium theater with a thousand seat house. So you really learned your craft, really learned it well. What was the decision to go to Hollywood as opposed to come to New York? Oh, it wasn't really a decision. I, I had no interest in going into films. My, my ambition, I was graduating. It was June. I'd finished my master's thesis, and I was going to read for all the rep companies around the United States in the following September. And I was going to prepare my scenes. And a man named Alan Pakula came through Chicago and saw me in a play and said, come to Hollywood and do a screen test for a film called The Sterile Cuckoo. I went to L.A. I did the screen test. I didn't get the part, but I met an agent. He said, would you just stay here for three weeks with your background? I can get you work. Well, he did. And I think my first job was a Carl Betts um, television series called Judd for the Defense. I got $1,800 for three days' work. Now, I used to live on $1,800 a year as a student, I mean, besides my tuition. That's what I lived on for a year, and I s and I'd never imagined it. I really had never fantasized making films, salary, none of that. But when the reality was there, and I was going, God, I $1,800 for three days' work, I can have a car, and it began. The enthusiasm to have a more financial, um, secu more financial security, and and also film acting. I knew nothing about it, and I'd been a student for so many years. It was like I suddenly saw a chance to be a student of the cinema. So my sort of student instincts were revitalized, and that's what I went on to do. 
Margaret Layton uh, gave you some advice, did she not? Know? Maggie Layton was great. My that first job, uh, I knew nothing about film acting, and my agent had said that I had done film. Oh dear! <laughs> so I came on the set, and I didn't know. I just watched these people, these actors doing close-ups, and they were so immobile that it not only looked unnatural to me, it felt terribly unnatural. And so I went to Margaret, I said, I want my confession and don't be mad, and I hope it's okay, but I have no experience, I have no idea what I'm doing, I don't know what to do standing still. And she being of the theater, you know, she said, why don't you come over tonight? So that first night of filming, I went over to her place, and she sat and talked to me about the, the essence of the art of filmmaking for an actor is about thought. And on a stage with a thousand seat houses, I mean, it has nothing to do with thought, really. It has to do with feeling, feeling very deeply. And, I, and that was like my beginning concept, that if I thought something hard enough and believably enough, that it would show through this, through the close-up. And um, I was ever so grateful to her building a little confidence in me to just finish that job because I, I was very nervous. Plus, I was speaking at volumes that were ridiculous. The sound man was like, oh, man, he was sitting over there. He'd keep cringing, you know. He'd, he'd turn the volume up because I'd get low, but then, I'd, then my theatrical <laughs> instinct would come and I'd be very loud. It was funny. It was funny. <laughs> John, I'm sorry, one second. Okay. Yeah, I've been getting occasional, uh, would you pause it? Is it this? Yeah, it's occasionally. Uh, what am I doing? It's been fine. You know what? I was sitting on the cord. Could that have been it? Uh, shouldn't shouldn't be. Cords. It's all right. More? No, we're fine. For Mark? Good? Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. The picture Diary of a Mad Housewife, you give a very, very strong performance, Oscar nominated as Tina. Mm. Um, how did that, that part come about for you? I had a contract to Universal Studios, and they put me to work, really put me to work. I think I did 11 television pieces, uh, guest spots on series and movies for TV, and then I did a film for Warner's, Warner Brothers, called Rabbit Run, from the John Updike novel. And, uh, and then Universal had this film in the process. They were pre-casting. Um, I auditioned for that film five different times. I came to New York, did screen tests for Frank Perry, and finally something I did was right. And, um, and we made that film. I must say, you see, I had no idea at the time the film that we were making. I, I had made so few films. Television I'd made, but um, that's real basic. It's kind of step A to B to C. Film, there's so much magic done with editing um, that I really had, I had not learned a process of, of um, visualizing the work, visualizing results. I wasn't in the business of results. I was in the business of um, um, accomplishing to the best of my ability the outpour of my character concept. When I sat down and saw that film, for the first time, that montage in the beginning, for instance, um, of Tina with the laundry and the window cleaner and the maid and all that montage, those were all very long scenes. Um, when I saw that and how in the first four minutes Frank had edited that film to the point where in the first four minutes you know everything about this woman's life, what she's, the, the harassment that she's going through, being um, the housekeeper, the, the senior housekeeper of her husband's domain. <laughs> you really got the feeling right away. From then on, all the way through the film, um, the photography, the photography was so brilliant and the sets were so perfect and the wardrobe and the casting, all the, even the very small parts. Um, Frank Perry was so good um, at that that I really, I, I was in awe. And about halfway through the film, I went, 
ooh, something's going on here. I don't know what this feeling is, but I feel a part of something magic. In working with, sure. 